Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Books and Books here in Coral Gables. We are live on the internet as we speak, as well as live here in the store. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, while you are silencing your cell phones, if you could take a quick look at our Books and Books newsletter, this will give you a breakdown of all the great events we have at Books and Books every night, every day, uh, just about every day of the year. Uh, a couple of note worth mentioning upcoming, we've got uh, Timothy Geithner, former U.S. Uh, Treasury, Secretary Treasurer, be uh, joining us with his new book, Stress Test. We also got uh, Emily and Mika Brzezinski will be joining us. We have Rick Atkinson. Any number of wonderful events. As I say, you can pick up a copy of this at the counter when you're buying your book of a thousand places you'd like to see before you die. Or you can go to our website at booksandbooks.com and we can get your email address and that way we can send you emails so that you don't miss a thing. Uh, and as of course, as you can see by the lights and the cameras, we are live streaming here. Uh, and while we love to have you in the store, you don't need to be. You can always watch on the internet. And if you'd like to ask a question of the author from the internet or even order a book while you're watching, you can call the store and uh, let us know that. We can get a book signed for you and ship it to you free of charge anywhere in the United States. And of course, I would like to say something very special tonight to um, the owner of Books and Books, so Mitchell Kaplan, who at this time is in Australia. So if he is watching, hi Mitchell, and also to let you know that um, I know you're 14 hours ahead, but uh, if you watch the Heat game and they win, please give me a call so I can get a bet down before they... Um, okay. The world's best-selling travel book is back in a more informative, more experimental, more budget-friendly, full-color edition. A number one New York Times bestseller, A Thousand Places reinvented the idea of travel as both a wish list and practical guide. As Newsweek wrote, it tells you what's beautiful, what's fun, and what's just unforgettable everywhere on Earth. And now the best is better. There are over 600 full-color photographs, over 200 entirely new entries, including visits to 28 countries like Lebanon, Croatia, Estonia, and Nicaragua that were not in the original edition. There's an emphasis on experiences. An entry covers not just Positano or Ravello, but the full 30-mile stretch along the Amalfi Coast. Every entry from the original edition has been readdressed, rewritten, and made fuller with more suggestions for places to stay, restaurants to visit, festivals to check out, and throughout the book is more budget conscious. Patricia Schultz is the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, A Thousand Places to See Before You Die, a veteran travel journalist with 25 years of experience. She has written for guides such as Fromers and Berlitz with periodicals including Wall Street Journal and Every Day with Rachel Ray. She also has executive produced a travel channel television show based on A Thousand Places to See Before You Die. Her home base is New York City. We're very happy to have her within Miami. Please welcome Patricia Schultz. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is my return visit to Books and Books. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I was here about two years ago when the revision came out. So the first book came out um, 10 years ago. I'm always trying to remind myself. In many ways, it seems like yesterday. In other ways, it seems like light years ago. Um, and it was so popular so immediately that I got that phone call from my publisher that every writer dreams of hearing, and that is, um, why don't we discuss your next project? So in the meantime, there was a um, cartoon that appeared in the Daily News that was a man in profile looking at what most obviously was the cover of A Thousand Places, but they had tweaked the title to read One Thousand Places to See After You Die by Shirley MacLaine. <laughs> Shirley, I figured, was not interested or available. So um, we did talk about what to do next. So when, in fact, you do the world, what do you do after that? So we did a kind of 180 and turned around to look and see what we had under our nose, to look and see what we have here in America, the USA and Canada, our neighbors to the north. So in my free time, I did 1,000 places to see in the USA, which was really very fun. A lot of my friends are like, oh, really, America? Who wants to see that? They were so accustomed to getting their passports and heading to places exotic and overseas. But those five years that it took me to do the book really were some of the most enlightening and educational and fun to do that crazy cross-country trip, zigzagging back and forth and stopping along the way, anywhere where it read homemade pie. <laughs> to me, that was the quintessence of everything that's wonderful and small town great about the US. And Canada, all of the national parks and the beautiful cities and the islands off the east coast and the west coast, it really was kind of a revelation. 
So that came out, uh, took me five years to do that in 2007, was immediately successful because only 30% of Americans have passports. So that's a whole lot of folks that are not leaving our shimmering shores. I got that phone call from my editor, let's talk about your next book. So okay, we've done the world, we've done America. Shirley MacLaine was not interested in doing her own title. And we did kick around the idea of 1,000 places in Europe. The presentation that I'm giving this evening is just Europe. I heard somebody mention, I wonder if she'll talk about Antarctica. In fact, I've just come back from Antarctica, but unless they've relocated it to Europe, I won't be talking about it this evening. Um, this evening, it just, just 30 places that are my favorites throughout Europe because Europe is so rich and the numbers of Americans going to Europe is far greater than any other destination in the world. It's easy for us, it's our natural, especially as East Coasters. West Coasters commonly go to the Pacific Islands, to Hawaii, part of America, kind of, um, the Pacific Islands and then farther west to the Far East. If you go west enough, it becomes the Far East. So what do you do then after the World Book, after America? We decided, that's an editorial we, I decided to rewrite almost entirely the original book because 10 years has transpired. The more you travel, the more you realize you understand nothing, you've seen nothing, and the more you kind of stumble on along the way. Um, I have discovered so many new places. I had seen so many new countries, and I had seen hundreds and hundreds of new places that I wanted to include in the book. So the revision came out two years ago. And um, is there room for a sequel as long as I continue to travel? Probably yes. Do I want to spend yet another five, seven years of my life putting a sequel together? I don't know. It's a huge undertaking. But my parents instilled in me early on this idea that if you do what you love, you know how the saying goes. You'll never work a day in your life. I'm not so sure about that. I've worked every day of my life but loved what I've done. So does it bring me great satisfaction and pleasure? You bet. Plus, I have a very thick passport. And there's a great expression about how you can't have a thick passport and a narrow mind. And I pride myself on knowing that travel is incredible education. It's invaluable. It really opens up your head. You can stay home and watch all of the glorious flat screen color documentaries from the National Geographic and Smithsonian and whatnot. And they are fabulous and they are educational. But there's nothing, nothing that comes close to the real deal to getting up and off the sofa and getting out the door, ideally with your passport. So I'm going to talk, like I said, a little bit just about Europe. And there's nothing really just about Europe because the diversity and the breadth and the possibilities in Europe really are mind-boggling. Um, I asked my nephew the other day, who's of an age where he should know how many countries he thought made up Europe. And he said 11. <laughs> I don't know why he grabbed the number 11 out of the sky. Um, there are 48 to 50 countries that make up Europe. Um, the largest might be Ukraine. We've heard so much about Ukraine in the last many weeks. It's not any of it very good. In fact, it's quite heartbreaking. But um, Ukraine, if you consider Ukraine Europe, that is the largest country. Other than that, the full-blown, entirely, absolutely 101% European, European nation that's largest in size is France, the size of Texas. So it's Ukraine, France, and 47, 48 other entities. The teensy tiniest smallest is the Vatican. Many lists, the United Nations lists, other lists don't even recognize it as a country, but let's give it that. Let's say it's the smallest country, and the Pope is its monarch almost, really. So. Um, I've chosen what I consider some of my favorites, but I have thousands of favorites. Um, hopefully, some of these will bring you down memory lane. Others will have you understand that, oh my god, you need to see it before you die. Others may be not you know, so interesting to you until I get done with them. <laughs> um, all of them, each of them, the beauty of Europe is that there is so much diversity because its history over the millennia has kept each of them very fiercely proud of their territory, of their customs. They've had their own currency, their own language still. With the common market, of which there are 28 states or members, there's become a real homogenization and a harm, harmonization. 
so that ultimately they'll all share the same rules and laws and language. English has become the lingua franca, which is great for us, but it also means that as in encouraging as it is that all of the young people with the internet and with learning how to speak English from the age of three or four in pre-K and whatnot makes travel for us very easy. It also means that the dialects are being lost and the regional customs and foods are being lost as they just become pan-Asian. So is there any time to visit Europe? It's now. I'm a queen of carpe diem, go sooner rather than later. Look what's happening to Ukraine. You think that things are just on the map and always will be, but you need to see them now. You never know. One coup, one earthquake, one uh, forest fire, one um, anything, and things that have forever been on the map for us suddenly aren't. So um, I'm starting with, I thought, help. <laughs> it's the page arrow. See, I can do this. I opened with this quote. Um, we kind of ultimately kicked around a few dozen and, and narrowed it down to this because um, I so love, first of all, um, Mark Twain, he's so wonderfully American with Huckleberry Finn, etc. But it turns out he was one of the most peripatetic vagabonds of his time, traveling to all corners of the world um, and coming home and writing about it. Um, you can see, as I mentioned before, so much in film. Um, you can read about it. Uh, you can you know, walk away from research and internet and uh, walking away with what you think is a very honed and, and sophisticated impression or um, idea of what a country is about and you go there and it's a whole other thing and almost always so much better. Um, I'm going to start with um, London, the most visited city in the world last year. This year it has passed the mantle to Paris. Yes, Paris is happy. For so many years, Paris has always been the most visited country in the world. But because of the Olympics, because of the Queen's 60th Jubilee anniversary for one year or even two, the numbers going to London were higher um, than Paris, than Hong Kong, the, one of the other most visited cities in the world. So I love this image in particular because this is the eye. It's not a Ferris wheel, it's an observation wheel. And these pods hold, um, can hold up to 100 people. In fact, they'll only put 25 people. I never made it off the bench because it is 440 feet high, which means that it's as high as a 40-story building directly on the Thames. It was built for the millennium. And it's, the meet, to me, the quintessence of modern-day London. From there, you can see up and down the Thames. You can see Parliament, Big Ben, so it's old. London, it's modern day London. Um, to me, London is one of the most beautiful, um, quintessentially British. Oh, I'm obviously not good at this. Um, quintessentially British cities, but not so much anymore because now with the European Union, the person behind your desk may be from Romania, your waiter is from Poland, your taxi cab driver is from France. That was really unheard of 10 years ago and even five years ago, but it has made London very international in a way that I find remarkable and where London folks are a little bit resistant. But um, England is one of the many countries that make up the UK. Not everybody knows that um, much about the UK, and many of these lists of countries recognize the UK as one country. In fact, it's made of, up of many, and my favorite, I love England and I love Wales, but my favorite is Scotland. Scotland really is just breathtakingly beautiful. And I found this image because to me it really speaks of the romance and the mystical beauty of Scotland. Um, this castle is one of 2,000. It has some of the most castles per square kilometer than any country in the world, as does Wales. There's a castle trail. There's also a whiskey trail because the Scots love their wee dram, often first thing in the morning. Um, they don't drive on what we consider the right side of the road. They dr drive on the left or what we consider the wrong side of the road. 
episode. So if you don't mind the idea that everybody who's been tippling their whiskey is driving in your direction, um, and it's very easy to get used to. There's also organized tours and whatnot. But the islands also off the coast are a great way to see Scotland. From New York, I flew direct to Edinburgh. Edinburgh is a really beautiful, beautiful city and has one of the largest, most incredible performing arts festivals every July and August. It goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, Edinburgh is very easy to reach by train. I love visiting all of um, not just the UK but all of Europe by train because really by the time you get to the airport which is outside of town you go through security you go through security checks you get on the plane you fly to wherever it is you're going and then the airports are invariably outside of town really you should just head to the train station Edinburgh to London is four hours by train so it's easy enough to visit areas within UK some of which are just a half an hour from London there are a lot of day trips in Scotland, as beautiful as Edinburgh is, really you want to see the highlands, you want to see the islands. The Scots, if you can understand them, <laughs> are some of the nicest people. This is a big year, the referendum for their independence. They fiercely wanted their independence for centuries. Whether it'll happen or not, I don't know. Also, it's the uh, year of the Riders' Cup that's happening in Scotland. There's a lot going on. This is Wales, also very famous for its castles, also famous for this incredible national coastal path. The Pembrokeshire Walk is 170 miles. It makes up a much larger 800-mile coastal national park, the only park of its kind in Europe. So if you're a rambler or a trekker or a walker, you can do just a few miles. You can hike from pub to pub. You can hike from inn to inn. There are organizations that do that and bring your luggage on to the next inn at the end of the day. Look at this coastal beauty. It's really beautiful. So this year, 2014, is the anniversary of the birth of Thomas Dillon, their greatest um, literary export. So there's a lot going on in Wales. Um, a surprising number of people speak Welsh. It's unlike anything I've heard. And the longest name of a city or a town anywhere in the world is in Wales. And it's about 150 consonants long with maybe two or three vowels. And I have no idea how to pronounce it. But it's a very peculiar language. It's a very interesting country. It's easy to get to from London. And it's part of the UK. Ireland, not part of the United Kingdom, but an incredible destination in itself, Kinsale. In County Cork, population 1,000, was voted by Forbes as one of the 10 friendliest cities in the world. Tiny, teensy little town which has anointed itself the gourmet capital of Ireland, which is almost an oxymoron because when you think Ireland, you do not think good food. But really, Ireland was a food movement waiting to happen because they have such incredible coastline, which means fresh rock lobster and fish. They have grass grazing lamb and cattle and whatnot. They have um, a beer industry that goes back centuries and just a young um, community that are always looking for innovations of tomorrow and in fact they've stumbled upon this idea that wouldn't it be brilliant if they finally did something with the Irish cuisine and you can actually eat very 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 well these days and every October Kinsale has a culinary festival. So Kinsale is very close to Cork, and Cork has an incredible Guinness Jazz Festival, one of the best anywhere. And Kinsale is often at the southernmost point of what is called the Wild West coastline of Ireland. It's the westernmost, it's almost the westernmost coast of Europe. The westernmost point is in farther south in Portugal, but it's a rugged, Atlantic, raw, beautiful coastline. Uh, so you fly into Dublin. Dublin was one of the other, one of the two Irish cities voted the 10 most friendly in the world. People come back from Ireland, maybe not yet speaking about the food. They do talk about the countryside and the fact that it seems to rain all of the time. But really, they talk about the people. The Irish people are lovely, wonderful, very welcoming. Almost all of them are now in America. They say that one out of every three Americans has Irish blood. And if you're in Manhattan on March 17th, you'll definitely believe that. 
So my um, enlightened nephew, who thought there were 11 countries in Europe, also referred to Scandinavia as the country of Scandinavia. So I know you know it's not a country, it's made up of many. Easternmost is Finland, which shares a border with Russia, and in fact is still very Russian in feel. And then there's Sweden, and that's what we're looking at. The capital is Stockholm. So Sweden is the largest. Stockholm, the city, the capital, is built on four islands. All of Scandinavia seems to be surrounded by water. The Vikings were their ancestors thousands of years ago, um, maybe even discovering or being the first Europeans to set foot in North America, they say, for the centuries before um, Columbus. But I digress. Stockholm is really interesting, very beautiful. One of the ports of call, if you do one of the cruises, the great cruise itineraries of the world is the Baltic cruise. Many of them begin in Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark, or in Stockholm, the capital of Sweden, and then go east and eventually north to St. Petersburg, which I'll talk about in a while as well. So the Swedes are lovely. Sweden is beautiful, but it's rather flat. Um, but the, the lifestyle itself is very wonderful. Sweden is commonly voted as having one of the best lifestyles, quality of life. They're one of the happiest nations in the world. And that surprises me because much of the year it's dark. And how you can be happy in January, February, and March when you only have two or three hours of sunlight, living here in Miami is probably hard for you to even wrap your mind around that. But it also means the flip side to that is in the summertime until 10, 11 o'clock at night, they have the midnight sun. So everything is always filled, the cafes, the outdoor cafes and wine bars, um, people are always on bikes. It's 10, 11 o'clock at night. You would think it's 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Norway, you can see, gets all of the physical beauty. Look at those mountains and these, they're, these fishing huts are painted red because of all of that midnight, um, that wintertime darkness that I was talking about. But in the summertime, there's so much light and it's a very Nordic ethereal light. And that made these fishing islands of the Lofoten a real artist community. And now it's really popular to come here, rent those fishing villages. So Norway is really popular for the fjords. The coastline of Norway is beautiful. It's really spectacular. Hundreds of fjords, maybe thousands. Oslo is really cool. The capital is beautiful. And Bergen, the capital of old, the old Norway kingdom, is where many of the boats who go up through the fjords leaves from. So you can go for a few hours, you can go for a few days. Um, Scandinavia is not inexpensive. In fact, it can be very expensive. But I have never written off a destination and not visited it because people have said, oh, it's expensive, or proven that it's expensive. If you do your homework, if you go off season, if you go in the shoulder season, if you do your homework with hotels, you can do Airbnb, just family-owned B&Bs or small inns. Breakfast is almost always included in your hotel. Lunch is a pizza, a, a sandwich, and then uh, dinner can be in a small neighborhood place where sometimes you can eat just as well as you can spending five times that amount. So is Scandinavia is expensive? Yes. But if you've seen Frozen, which is inspired especially by Norway, but all of Scandinavia. You'll understand something of the Scandinavian lifestyle, and it is wonderful. I really, really love Norway. The Scandinavians are all tall, blonde, and beautiful. They're very um, polyglot. Most of them speak English better than my friends or me. They're very well-traveled. They're very cultural. They're very welcoming. It's a very safe place to visit, especially if you're traveling alone, maybe, or especially if you're kind of a a travel newbie and you're a little hesitant, where do you go? Start with Scandinavia. Tivoli, the Tivoli Gardens. It's always Christmas time in Copenhagen. Uh, so Copenhagen was one of the other cities that was voted um, one of the happiest in the world. And Denmark is commonly voted as one of the friendliest nations for all of the reasons that I was saying for, to me, because I don't know them well, the Swedes, the Norwegians, the Danes, the Finns, they're all kind of interchangeable. They would shoot me if they heard me say that. Because while they share a lot of customs and traditions, they do not necessarily share a language. The Finnish language is kind of unique unto itself. But there's so much similarity. But generally speaking, this northern destination um, of northern Europe is um, very interesting. Also, part of the kingdom of Denmark is Iceland. 
Iceland is actually closer to America than it is to mainland Europe. And it's kind of Danish in some ways, but it's autonomous, it's independent. It had something of an economic crash two or three years ago, so it was a real bargain. It no longer is. It's still very inexpensive, however, and it's pretty easy to get to. From, from New York, it's only four hours. 2014 by NASA was said to be the best year to view the Northern Lights. But the Northern Lights are best seen until more or less April. So we've missed it, but they pick up again in October, November. 2014 will be an exceptional year. When you see the Northern Lights, it is something you will remember forever. There's no guarantee. They're hard to explain. This actually is a very tame image of what the Northern Lights can be like. The sky has to be completely dark. There can't be any light pollution. So if you go out into the countryside and you look up, you'll see a spectacle that really is quite beautiful. Reykjavik is the capital of Iceland, and it's the smallest European capital. It's only about 200,000 people, and I have that many people that live in my building in <laughs> midtown Manhattan. So it's very small, and it's very friendly, and it's very safe. But Reykjavik is interesting enough, but really what you want to do is the ring road, and it's a single road that, um, that uh, follows the coastline and goes through some of the parks that um, make Iceland so beautiful. Jules Verne used Iceland as the inspiration for his journey to the center of the Earth. It's very lunar, it's very volcanic. If you remember the volcano exploding or erupting about a year ago and kind of paralyzing air traffic for days. It was quite unprecedented, but it reminds you just how active and volcanic the island is. So here we are on mainland, back in mainland, back in Germany. Germany is the most populated. And it's the fourth largest. It's quite a large country. And you won't see the big open expanses of empty land like you will in some of Scandinavia or in Iceland. It's quite developed. But there's so much to see. I love Bavaria. Bamberg in Bavaria is a UNESCO, the historical center for Bamberg, is a UNESCO protected site. It goes back um, as the capital of the ancient Roman Empire in the 11th century. This is the Rathaus. Rathaus means town hall. And it's one of so many beautiful um, examples of architecture that represent the various centuries that go back a thousand years. Um, it's a university town, which means it has a very young energy. Um, it has a really big beer legacy. Um, it has eight breweries, which leaves nearby Munich in the dust. And they make over 50 different kinds of beer. And so those students are always very happy. <laughs> and there's um, even an Oktoberfest every August. So they beat Munich to the, to the punch. And it's just a beautiful, um, historically rich, uh, easy day trip, actually, from Munich. But it really deserves, as many day trips do, to spend um, a night or three or more to just uh, get into this slow travel mode of planting yourself, um, exploring the city well. All of these small towns throughout Germany and throughout all of Europe are very interesting. I love the big capital cities. That's where the great museums are, the great, mu um, the great restaurants and all of that. But much of Europe um, is best experienced in the small towns. Amsterdam. I had been, of course, right after college backpacking through Europe, because you kind of have to, to check out that whole red light district thing. Um, and then I'd been a number of times, but the years went by and I visited again last year and I remembered all over again what an incredible city Amsterdam is. It's beautiful. And I chose this photograph in particular because it kind of has everything that I love and that everybody loves so much about Amsterdam. The canals. The canals are a UNESCO World Heritage Site, 400 years old. So last year they celebrated their 400th anniversary. So, you know, what were we doing 400 years ago? Partially natural, the canals, partially um, man-made. It's an engineering feat that to this day has never been um, matched. 
all of the, I think there are 165 or 145 canals. Um, all of the bridges that cross the canal, some of them pedestrian, most of them um, the vehicular car traffic bridges, all of the students, there are many universities, everybody's 20 something, so it's very young. All of the bikes, there are more bikes than there are residents. I don't really understand that. <laughs> many people say that there are two bikes to every resident. I don't know, maybe they have like a country bicycle and a city bicycle, I don't know. And this incredible architecture, all of the very wealthy Dutch merchants built very, very tall and narrow and gabled homes. They would live on the top floors and they would use the bottom floors as their warehouses and their office. So last year, in addition to celebrating the 400th anniversary of the canals, it was also the opening of the Rijksmuseum, the Rijksmuseum, which is a showcase for all of the Dutch masters, especially um, Rembrandt, the name almost um, didn't come to mind. Um, also the Van Gogh, Museum opened a particular annex that had been closed for renovation. Um, it's, there's always something going on. You don't need to have these special anniversaries or commemoration because every year and every month, it's a great city. All of the, the, the capitals are great to see off season because there's, it's often when their cultural seasons are in high spring, when it's opera and ballet in high swing, when it's opera season and, and, and ballet season, all of the theaters are, are flourishing. Um, and it's when prices are lowest, it's easiest to get discounts in the hotels. You can walk into any restaurant and get a table, and you kind of feel like one of the locals. You're not standing in line for three hours to get into the museum. So consider going to Europe off-season. Antwerp and Bruges are two smaller day-trip cities from Brussels, the capital of Belgium, that are spectacular. It's only about half an hour from Brussels to Antwerp. And it was very, very influential and prominent and flourishing in the 16th and 17th century. And it was the seat of the Flemish Renaissance. It's the home of Rubens, who went to Italy to study, came back and spent the rest of his life um, finding his inspiration and his muse in his hometown. Great architecture. Great art scene, a lot of style and fashion in Antwerp. The diamond industry of the world is here, a lot of money. Um, all of the chocolate and the beer and the moule frit that you find in Brussels, you find here in spades. Again, easy day trip. Most people come in for a few hours, but I suggest staying for overnight or so. It's also on an estuary, so it's one of the ports of call that I was talking about before with that great itinerary that goes to the Baltics. Many of them on the return from St. Petersburg will come to um, Amsterdam, Antwerp on its way to London and finish in London. Austria is pretty gorgeous. <gasps> and look at those mountains. It's got alpine beauty in spades. Hallstatt, I love to say that, Hallstatt is a tiny little town that is a UNESCO site because it is said to be the oldest continuously inhabited settlement, because it's tiny, in Europe. Even before ancient Rome, they've found artifacts that go back 7,000 years. It has the oldest salt mine that was made by the ancient Romans in all of the world. And above and beyond that, it's just like fairy tale, picture perfect, postcard beautiful. It's about an hour or two outside of Salzburg. And Salzburg is just so beautiful. Baroque Salzburg, the birthplace of Mozart. And, um, and Vienna as well. I don't have images of those because all of these countries, I'm just trying to find one image alone that kind of best captures places that I have found to be highlights or the most beautiful attractions that you find in the country. And in a country like Austria, as with all of them, there's just so much diversity. But Hallstatt is one of those beautiful lakeside towns that in high season, it um, explodes into 15, 16,000 people. So even at its worst, it's never very big or overcrowded or congested. And there's a very, very scenic road from Salzburg that comes here. 
Also, another small town is called Dernstein, which is just outside of Vienna. Vienna is on the Danube, and I'm going to talk um, a little bit later about all of the river cruises now that are so popular, um, all of the river cruises with, um, throughout Europe. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of river boats when um, just three to five years ago there were just a handful. This is the Glacier Express in Switzerland. It takes about eight hours to go 150 miles, but it's an engineering feat, and you go for the scenery alone. And it's one of many of these little red engine trains that could, that you'll find in Switzerland, but it's also a reminder kind of to me to talk about the various trains throughout Europe, because I was talking about the high-speed trains and how this network of train travel throughout Europe makes it so easy to kind of stick to terra firma rather than fly from A to B to C by plane. But there are a lot of scenic trains that are um, either n um, not meant to get you anywhere. It's all about the journey rather than the destination. And there are two or three in Switzerland alone that go through um, tunnels and over viaducts and um, through scenery that really is just breathtaking. There's also, um, of course, the Orient Express train from London to Venice and once or twice a year goes on to the original destination of Istanbul. That's very white glove, five star, very expensive, very wonderful. These other trains are not half that and they're usually day trains or just a few hours. There's one um, that goes across northern Spain called the Transcantabrico because it's Cantabria, that particular province. There's a circular loop in Andalusia that's actually um, a departure that I'm hosting in September, so do come along. And it's a um, hundred year old train that was once used and owned by the British royalty when they traveled um, by boat across the English Channel from northern France to the Côte d'Azur where they used to summer. And they scrapped the train um, a few decades ago. Spain bought it, refurbished it, rehabbed it, and now it's a week long train ride that goes all through Andalusia. It originates in Seville, and it does Cordoba, Granada, and I'll talk about those wonderful, wonderful cities. I used to live in Spain, so my heart still, a little piece of my heart still remains there. So what to do with France? Where do you even begin with France? France is the largest country unless you consider Ukraine. France is the size of Texas. So much to see in France. Paris, as I said before, is one of the most visited cities in the world. Who doesn't want to go to Paris? Don't raise your hand, because I asked that rhetorical question the other day, and somebody very timidly raised their hand. And then I asked them, have you ever been? They had never been. And I said, you must go. Everybody should see Paris at least once. Audrey Hepburn said, Paris, it's always a wonderful idea. And it is Paris in the springtime, Paris in the fall. There's so much to see. So 2014, the 70th anniversary of Normandy, the invasion of Normandy. So there's a lot going on to commemorate that horrific moment and in our history. But Normandy was also famous as the inspiration for the, the Impressionists. So there's so much to see. From Paris, you go to Giverny, which is the home of Monet. And Monet was many, one of the many um, painters and artists who would go up to the coastline of Normandy. And there they found their inspiration. And painting in plein air, in the open outdoor, you know, where the world was their studio, um, that's where really Impressionism took root. This is, however, Provence. And now, if you breathe really deep, <laughs> you can almost smell the lavender, which is just, well, it'll be another month before it starts blooming, especially in an area called Luberon. But Provence is beautiful, and everybody has this vision of renting a villa in Provence or Tuscany in in outside of Florence in Italy, for example. And if there's any way you ever can, it's actually not that expensive especially if you get together friends or family, oftentimes three generations. There's such a proliferation of villas and farmhouses and whatnot that per person, per night, you'll spend maybe even $50, sometimes 20 sometimes $100 a person, but the experience is incredible. So Provence goes from this area all the way down to the coastline, to the Côte d'Azur. It's called Provence. Actually, I didn't know m until I researched it. It was called Provence because the ancient Romans settled Provence and called it Provincia. It was the first province north of the Alps that they settled, 
not the last but the first, and hence the name Provence, because Provence simply means province. Um, not far from here is Lyon, one of my favorite cities, a small Paris. The train network throughout France has the high-speed trains that you find now everywhere throughout Europe. Um, also, I just read this morning in the paper the overnight train that used to take 12 or 13 hours from Paris to Barcelona over the Pyrenees, over the Spanish border to the wonderful city of Barcelona. It used to take 12 or 13 hours. Now it takes six. Why bother getting on an airplane? But it's so easy now to access a lot of these cities that were once very far flung that would take an entire day to get there. Now it takes next to nothing. And you can see so much along the way. I'm having a hard time with this. I'm wanting to believe that it's not me. <gasps> Portugal. Portugal is kind of Spain's um, sibling in that it shares the Iberian Peninsula, so much history, um, a Latin language. If you can speak Castellan Spanish, you can really understand Portuguese, Portuguese Portuguese versus Brazilian Portuguese, which is an entirely different thing, and I think twice is beautiful, but don't tell that to Portugal. But um, it's not... Um, it's one of the less expensive destinations. It's got an incredible wine thing going on up in the Douro Valley in the north. It has a beautiful coastline. This is Sintra, which is a really, really popular day trip outside of Lisbon, the capital, beautiful capital, um, just about 20 miles, really. And it was where, in fact, the Portuguese royalty summered to leave the capital city and all of their problems in the summer heat. This is one of three castles in Sintra. So um, it's a UNESCO site, or either maybe the whole city is a UNESCO site. So the oldest of the three goes back to the 8th century, and it's just ruins, but it's up on a hill, and you see all of the area. It's really quite beautiful. And I'll talk about the ruins and the Moors who built that castle um, in the 8th century. This is um, Pena, P-E-N-A, Pena. And it was built rather recently in the 1800s, and it was where the uh, Portuguese royalty summered or escaped to every summer until the 19, 1910, when there was the Portuguese Revolution. Um, it's been restored, so these colors are very vi vibrant and, and kind of over the top. You wonder if that's really what it looked like. They say it, it did. And it's beautiful because it's almost as if the royal family just left. Everything inside has been left as it was, and it's f fully furnished, and it's really very beautiful. And not far from there is Cabo de Roca, which is the westernmost point of Europe. So there's nothing between you and... New York. <laughs> and it's very windy and it's very raw and it's very Atlantic drama and it's really very beautiful. So here we are in Cordoba. <gasps> Cordoba, all of Andalusia for me is heaven. I was lucky enough to do junior year abroad in Spain. Really you can do junior year abroad anywhere in the world and the experience is priceless. Um, I thought I was cool, I thought I knew the world, I thought I had been around and then I spent a year in one culture that was not my own, totally immersed, 24-7, trying to make some sense of a world that was so far removed from anything I knew about in America, and it was like four years back at university. Um, also, we realized the first or second day into our junior year that the professors didn't care much whether we showed up for class or not, because they were brilliant enough to understand that it was not about what we learned within those four walls of the classroom, but what we were gleaning and learning linguistically, culturally, psychologically from living as a very young, impressionable student. At that point when you're trying to understand something of yourself and the world and your place in the world and having the luxury of being not just breezing through or spending even to have the luxury of a few weeks, but to be there for a full year. And it really, really opened my world. And I even came back speaking Spanish pretty well. But don't ask me to do so now because too many centuries have transpired in the meantime. However, from Spain, from Madrid, into Andalusia was very easy by train. And we were always visiting and discovering the next great thing in Andalusia because it's jam-packed with history, mostly the Moors who came here in the 8th century. 
and created, especially in Cordoba, but all throughout the Iberian Peninsula, including um, Portugal in those 8th century castle ruins that I just mentioned. They created here what they hoped would be eventually world domination, coming from northern Africa over the Strait of Gibraltar into Spain, creating their base here for four centuries. And one of the most sophisticated and one of the most um, really mind-boggling, sophisticated and progressive communities where they would bring in Jews and Christians and the brains and the intelligentsia of all of Europe to come to the courts here and brainstorm. And it really was fascinating for what they created. This mesquita was built as a mosque on top of a fifth century church. If this looks very arabesque and Islamic and Muslim architecture, it actually was the um, columns and uh, marble and um, decor that they kind of recycled from the fifth century church. So when the Catholic monarchs came in and booted with great difficulty the Arabs from Iberia back into um, North Africa from whence they had come. They built on top of the mosque the largest, most prominent cathedral. So as a kind of statement that they had liberated Spain from the Moors. And um, it's now called, as a UNESCO site, the Mesquita Catedral, the mosque cathedral, because it's kind of both. And it's a really interesting example of recycling cultures and religions and architecture. So Andalusia gave us, of course, flamenco. It gave us the music and the dance of this incredible genre of um, called flamenco that just the very mention of it gives me goosebumps because it's ancient and haunting and romantic and wonderful. You'll also find Seville, Cordoba, Granada, where the Alhambra is. The Alhambra was built by the Moors as a castle. Alhambra means red fort so it was a kind of fortress residence. Um, it's an incredible corner of Europe that is totally unique because it does not share really any kind of history with anything you'll find either in the Mediterranean or north of here. Um, and the, the Andalusians are fiercely proud and don't even consider themselves really Spanish. But however, if I may quote Robert Browning, if you open my heart, you will see engraved inside of it, Italy. <gasps> so, okay, I'm half Italian. You don't have to be to find that Italy probably is, I think, without being at all biased, the most remarkable destination in the world. <laughs> so as you can imagine, people are always asking me, what is your favorite place, your favorite destination? Rather than a particular town or village or museum or valley or waterfall, et cetera, as a country or as a nation, I always immediately what comes to mind is a whole flood of places, and they're all located within Italy. Venice, Bologna, Cinque Terre, Sicily, Palermo. Sicily is not even really part of Italy. There's always somebody that comes to me afterwards and says, but you know it is. <gasps> but it is, exists in its own world. Um, Calabria, <coughs> Naples is incredible. Because it was not formed as a kingdom until 1860, the 20 different regions of Italy remained their own little kingdom. So they had their own cuisine, which to this day, there are certain pastas and sauces and preparation you'll find in one city, which they wouldn't think of preparing elsewhere. They had their own currencies. They had their own, their own schools of art. They had their own dialects, which were so developed that they were almost as if languages. A Venetian and a Sicilian cannot understand each other. In 2014, and they try to still keep it alive with the internet, with radio, communication, television. It's grossly and sadly being lost, but it still very much exists. I lived in Florence for five years. After graduation, I went for a few weeks. His name was Giovanni. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It was um, me doing uh, what I kept telling my mother, who is from southern Italy, was uh, the discovery of my roots. 
ancestral tourism is a very real niche of tourism. Whether you go to Cuba, go back to Asia, so much of America goes back to Europe, even to England if your relatives came over on the, the Mayflower, there always is, I think, that inherent interest of where our parents, our great-great-grandparents, maybe you've done the family tree and you've discovered that, voila, your great-grandfather was Irish, which I just did last month. Who knew I had Irish blood? But when I mentioned before that one out of every three Americans has Irish blood in them, <laughs> I found out that very thing. And I wouldn't be surprised if so many of you do as well. You just don't know it. Um, anyway, the Cinque Terre is pretty special. It's part of the Italian Riviera, which is the province, the region of Liguria. And it's outside of Genoa, which is believed to be the hometown of Marco, Marco Polo. No, that's Venice. It's believed to be the hometown of Christopher Columbus. So these are the little fishing villages. Cinque Terre means the five lands. Until not all that long ago, they were separated from each other and only reachable by boat. And then the train line came in, and then the highway, the autostrada, and then came the crowds. First they were just Italians, because even the Italians dream about the Mediterranean Italy of a hundred years ago. But then the rest of Europe descended, and then the Americans discovered Cinque Terre. Now everybody's been, there's incredible hiking and walking here. You can walk from one town to the next, to the next, to the next, using old mule paths <coughs> on cliffs that go down to the <coughs> sea that are terraced, and they make some of the best white wine in the Mediterranean. And the food, I mean, can you get a bad meal in Italy? <gasps> Um, the people are wonderful. I could go on and on, and if you had a few days, um, I could tell you a thousand places just in Italy alone. In fact, that was a title that we were kicking around because there is just so much to see. In Italy alone, there are 64 World Heritage Sites that are recognized by UNESCO. 64. There are countries in this world that would kill for one because of the prestige it brings them, the recognition, and the American dollars, or the tourism dollars in general. Italy is chock-a-block. Florence, Venice, Bologna, Milano, the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, the Vatican Galleries. And, I mean, really, it just is one big museum. So, okay, I'm Italian. That 50% of me that is German always kind of blends, you know, fades into the background. Um, I'm instead like 110% Italian, or so I was raised to believe. My husband is like 600% Greek. <laughs> and I had to put this in there for him. I also put it in there because I just love Greece, and that whole Mediterranean thing is kind of cursing through my body. Um, I, in my naivete, when I was researching the book, thought that there were a couple dozen Greek islands. I knew that there were much more than that. I thought maybe 100, 150. There are 600 inhabited islands, sometimes with no more than a few families these days. But 600 inhabited islands, there are thousands. Some of them are no bigger than this podium. Santorini and the Cycladic Islands. There are 200 islands in this group. Santorini and Mykonos are the most known. If you're lucky enough to do a tour, a cruise of the Greek islands, almost invariably they stop in Santorini. You can see those cruise ships. There are two of them. There often are 12. If it's June, July, and August, and you're all disgorging your thousands of passengers at the same time, Santorini can be overwhelmed. But if it's off season, and if you're staying overnight, and those pesky cruise passengers have gone back on their ship and sailed off to the next island, Santorini is magical. And it's famous for its sunsets. Um, you can see here how almost you can see there's a crescent, which is the uppermost reaches of what was a volcano that collapsed unto itself, sank underwater, and it's called a caldera. And all of the whitewashed cubic architecture for which the Cycladic Islands are known, with those beautiful blue domes, which almost always are chapels and churches, all of the villages, all of the people live on top. And that's what you're seeing here. They all kind of face um, the most beautiful sunsets anywhere. 
Life is very simple. They still, in some of the far-reaching villages where tourism never makes its way to, still travel by donkey. It's a very simple life. Many Athenians have their homes here. But um, wherever there's a airport on a Greek island, there are large numbers of tourists. So it's kind of the unspoken rule. If you really want to experience the authentic and the real and the old world Greek island pace, you get on a ferry, sometimes for two or three hours, sometimes overnight, and you go to those far-flung islands that don't yet have airports. It just kind of makes sense. Crete is the southernmost and the largest and is very kind of un-Greek. It marches to its own tune, its own legacy, its own history. Many of the island groups have their own architecture, they have their own dialect, um, they have their own history. It's very, very interesting. Athens is beautiful. They're having a hard time, if you haven't heard, <laughs> in Greece. Um, this lifestyle, which is their own interpretation of the Dolce Vita that's been going on since forever, isn't working out too well for them anymore. Um, are they giving Greece away? You'll find great deals. You'll find great inexpensive ways to experience Greece. But it's not a giveaway. It's not cheap. It is, however, not as expensive as some other places. So those um, tours through uh, by cruise through the Greek islands often go to the coastline of Turkey. Is Turkey even part of Europe? Not Ephesus, which is what we're looking at, but I put this in because I love Turkey. And Turkey actually is part of Europe. It's one of the applicants into the European Union, which is hard to believe because if you visited Istanbul, there is nothing less European than, than Istanbul. 20% of Istanbul is in Europe. 80% of Istanbul is in Asia. It's one of only two countries, Turkey and Russia, that are transcontinental in Europe, with one foot in Europe and most of the country in Asia. It's, it's, Istanbul is the only city in the world that's transcontinental, and it has this beautiful bridge called the Bosphorus Bridge, which connects the two continents, which is really cool when you think about it. There now are other bridges, and there's now a tunnel underneath the Bosphorus that just opened about a month ago. So if they can build a tunnel underneath the English Channel 20 years ago this year, they certainly can build a tunnel underneath the Bosphorus. So all of that exchange between Europe and Asia over the millennia is really fascinating. You'll see it in the faces of the people, you'll see it in their traditions, you'll see it in their food, you'll see it in their architecture. Istanbul to me simply is one of the most incredible cities anywhere, not just in Europe but anywhere on the globe. Ephesus in its day 2,000 years ago was a city of 400,000 people. And it was the outpost of the ancient Roman Empire, and it was the capital of Asia Minor. This is the Celsus Library that was built in the first century. It's only still standing because they re-erected it. <laughs> but they found, I think it's about 80% original material. Ephesus was a really revelation to me because in its day it was one of the most sophisticated cities anywhere. And to see how the people lived in a way 2,000 years ago that they are able to recreate and study and relate um, the, the, the latrines, the three, four-story houses with incredible um, mosaics, a uh, very sophisticated and very advanced civilization. So we're hearing a lot about Russia, especially during the Olympics. I'm going to fast forward because we'll never make it through um, the rest of Europe. But this is, you hear about St. Petersburg, the home of the Tsars. You hear about Moscow, the Kremlin, the seat of the government, our friend Putin. Um, everything that's going on now, Russia is foremost and forefront in the news these days. There is a way to get from St. Petersburg, which is magnificent in the north, to Moscow very much night and day, apples and oranges, two entirely different experiences. There used to be, I took in the early 90s, an incredible train ride that was 13 hours to get from Moscow to St. Petersburg, 
four hours today. I kind of bemoaned those old slow travel ways of getting from A to B. Um, nobody told us there was no food on the train, but we were thrown into a compartment with a Siberian family, didn't speak Siberian, but I learned a lot about Siberian hospitality, and they fed us. <laughs> um, but there's also what's called the waterway of the czars. And so you can go on a river cruise that's um, canals, channels, lakes, that will get you from Moscow to St. Petersburg. And one of the stops along the way is Kiji Island. It's a world uh, heritage site. This is the Church of the Transfiguration, 22 domes made in the early 1700s without a single nail. So they've gathered together 80 of incredible architectural um, samples from across the centuries and brought them here for safekeeping. So it really is a very fascinating place to visit. Russia is rich with incredible history. I just was in um, Central Asia last week in the far-flung areas that once were part of the Soviet Union, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, all the stands that were famous during the time of the Silk Road, now independent. They still speak Russian, it still feels Soviet. It's a very interesting time, it's 20 years later. The wall came down in 1989, seems like just last year. So Russia in all of its um, multifaceted uh, history is really an incredible place to visit. So Eastern Europe, I really will make this fast. -er. Um, the three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, often kind of clumped together because they're quite small and they're almost always visited together and you can get from A to B to C quite easily. This is Riga and Riga is the capital of Latvia, a very small country. Riga is the cultural capital for 2014. So every year there are two cultural capitals and they spend all kinds of money and effort to kind of pretty them up and make them and hope that the crowds will come. The crowds are coming anyway to Riga because it's just so beautiful. So I love this architecture, but really one of the reasons that Riga is on the UNESCO map is because there's a neighborhood of Art Nouveau architecture, 70, um, actually I think it's 700 facades that were built during the Art Deco time that gave Riga the nickname of the Paris of Eastern Europe. Part of the Soviet bloc now open for business, wanting desperately all of those tourism dollars that um, they were deprived of during their years under the Soviet thumb. And all of Eastern Europe is very, very interesting to visit. I also have some other places. This is Krakow in Poland. This is um, a 13th century central square, also UNESCO protected, the largest central square in all of Europe, the largest. You could kind of walk around for days and never leave this central square. It was also designated, I don't know who voted, but um, it was given the title of the liveliest central square in Europe because there's always something going on. There are buskers and mimes and musicians and 10, 11 o'clock at night there's always, and it, they have an old university that goes back I think to the 14th century, so Krakow is very young. There's a great energy, it's a lot of fun. The same with Warsaw, you have these dark images. For example, right outside of Krakow is Auschwitz. It has a very dark history. Poland, as did much of Eastern Europe, but 2014, you would almost forget quite easily what had happened in the not distant future. The Poles are wonderful, um, lovely people, very hospitable. Prague, the fourth most visited city, London, Paris, or Paris, London, Rome, and Prague. 20 years ago, Soviet, nobody was going to Prague. These days, this is the 14th century Charles Bridge. To see it this empty, you have to go at 4 o'clock in the morning. It is packed. The tourists, the groups, it is young, it is wonderful. Prague is beautiful. Prague is a magnificent city. It also has the highest consumption of beer per capita in the world. <laughs> so those beer halls are always full. Um, Pilsner is made in the Czech Republic. Um, Budweiser apparently traces its roots back here. Very long-standing beer producing um, legacy. But all of the Czech Republic is really quite beautiful. You know that it used to be Czechoslovakia, then with the Russian, rev uh, the Velvet uh, Revolution, it divided into the Czech Republic and Slovakia, um, east of here. Slovakia only recently is getting tourism, mostly Europeans. 
Americans don't even know where Slovakia is, let alone the capital of Bratislava. This is Ukraine. And, mm, you know, I guess the, the rule of thumb is to see it now. Not Ukraine, but Europe or the world in general. Because as this 90-year-old woman that I met in Machu Picchu on her 90th birthday in her 70th wedding anniversary said to me, you know your knees have expiration dates. <laughs> so travel when you can. There are no guarantees. Our health, you'll never be as young as you are today. I wish you all the best of health until you're 110. But as my 98-year-old aunt says, the only thing you want to see in your later years is the view from your front porch. In the meantime, I say go up and out and go and see places like Ukraine that is so rich in culture. One revolution, one war, one Putin, one fire, one problem, and places are kind of yanked off the map. Europe, you wouldn't think that would happen. In the Middle East, in Syria, Yemen, look what's happening. We're kind of used to hearing that type of thing. Ukraine, who would have thought two or three years ago? So um, an incredible country, lovely people. I realized that in all of this, I had very few people. So this is Budapest. And these are the baths in Budapest. There's no other country or city, capital city like Budapest, that has so much volcanic activity underneath it. There are 14 natural springs. So the baths of Budapest are, um, go, they go back actually to the Ottomans because the Turks came this far north into Europe and kind of stopped in Hungary and could not progress further. But they left behind this culture of the baths. And this, I love the guy in the blue cap. And I love the fact that it's co-ed day at this particular bath because many of them are either men one day and women the next, or men in the morning and the women in the afternoon. So here, and even though it's co-ed, they still stay, stay comfortably separated, mostly because the guys will sit there for hours reading newspaper, discussing um, soccer scores, playing chess. It's really an incredible insight into the Hungarian um, culture. Budapest is just beautiful. It's one, it's one of four capital cities in Europe that is on the Danube. So I was talking about those cruises before, the river cruises. Um, there is Vienna on the Danube, Budapest, Buda on one side, Pest on the other, connected by that incredibly beautiful chain bridge that you always see illuminated at night. Bratislava. I was just mentioning Slovakia before and Belgrade in Serbia. So you can go on these cruises for a couple days, two or three nights. You can start in Amsterdam and for three weeks take all of these various tributaries and rivers all throughout Europe. You don't pack and unpack. It's like a cruise in Europe versus deep sea cruising. Romania, oops, it's getting late. You guys have to go dancing. Um, Romania, also Eastern Europe, it's actually part of the European Union, but it doesn't yet have the Euro. It will eventually see it now because it's really probably one of the most fascinating, least commercialized and inexpensive, one of the most inexpensive destinations in Europe, as is Slovakia, doesn't yet have the Europe, Euro. Um, it is one of the 28 member uh, nations that make up the EU. These are the painted monasteries. They go back to the Middle Ages. They are covered with frescoes and murals inside and out, top to bottom, because the people were illiterate. They wanted to hear about the Turks and how they had won battles over the Turks. They wanted to hear about the Bible. And they could see it almost as if cartoons. This was their uh, newspaper. This is how they got news. This is how they got inspiration. This is where they came to worship eight churches, seven of which are World Heritage Sites. Romania also has Transylvania. It's the home of Dracula. They kept resisting that image until the tourism realized that they may as well go with it because it was bringing in people. So there is a castle called um, Dracula's Castle where he is believed to have stayed, I think, one night. <laughs> but people flock there still. Um, this is Slovenia, former Yugoslavia. There was a war. It ended in 95 people. Um, people are still saying to me that I'll go when the war is over. No, the war is over. It's 10 years, and they want your tourism business. It, has a sh it shares a border with Italy, so Slovenia, which is small. It's, I think, um, one of the five smallest nations of the 48 countries in Europe. 
and it's the size of New Jersey. It's easy to get around. It has the Alps. It has an incredible food scene. So all of the wine and the truffles and all of the, the fresh fish along the coastline that you see coming or that you can experience just across the Adriatic in Venice, you can have here. Its neighbor to the south is Croatia. Slovenia's capital is Ljubljana. I love that name. It kind of rolls off your tongue with all of those consonants. Um, Ljubljana is really small and beautiful and pedestrian with great cafes and museums and whatnot. And this is Dubrovnik, the pearl of the Adriatic. So this incredible coastline, Croatia, from Slovenia down to where you see Montenegro. These are all of the countries that once made up Yugoslavia. Croatia gets most of the ink, as they say, most of the attention because of the thousand islands, count them. Actually, it's 1,234, but again, some the size of that table. Um, and the southernmost point is Dubrovnik. And look at these incredible walls that you, Dubrovnik in its day was actually an independent republic, but it's now part of Yugoslavia and it's beautiful. All of Croatia is really very, very beautiful. If you haven't been, you gotta go. And um, I think I end here. This is Montenegro that I mentioned before. So Dubrovnik is quite large. Montenegro is teensy tiny. Um, it has a very small coastline, but it's this fjord-like bay called Kotor that if you start your cruise in Venice, you come down the Croatian coast, you stop in Dubrovnik, then you pull in, you take a left, and you go east into this in beautiful, incredibly beautiful bay called Kotor and um, Montenegro. So a lot of this architecture looks Italian or Venetian because the Serene Republic for a thousand years ruled so much of this area of the East Mediterranean, including what used to be Yugoslavia. So on that note, I believe I finished. <sighs> okay, and no, no quiz, no test. We've seen 30 countries of the 48. Hopefully you've added many of them to your bucket list. Hopefully you've discovered a few places that either you didn't know existed or that you had to see before you died. So thanks for coming, everyone, and thanks for the invitation to Books and Books. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you very much. Folks, again, if you'd like a book, we have them for sale behind the counter. Patricia will sit right here and sign them for you. If you're watching online, call us. We'll get you one signed. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.